Hello everyone, my name is Annabeth Hayes and I am the Curator of Decorative Arts at the Tennessee State Museum. And today I'm going to be talking to you about Courier and Ives, a lithography firm and their depiction of 19th century America with their cheap and popular prints. Courier and Ives were the most prolific and arguably one of the most important lithography firms of the 19th century. Before the rise of photojournalism, Many Americans relied on looking at hand-colored lithographs and other prints to see the events that they read about in newspapers. The firm initially began with Nathaniel Courier, who established an independent business in 1834, and he was already a successful lithographer when he joined forces with a man named James Merritt Ives in 1852. Based in New York under the name of Courier and Ives, they produced some of the country's most popular wall hangings in the 19th century. Their prints depicted a wide range of subjects from political events, urban and rural landscapes, humor, sports, and household activities, among others. And their sons continued the family business until they ultimately sold it in 1907. When the prints had a resurgence of popularity in the 20th century among collectors, a man named Harry Peters compiled some of their more popular images into a book while also documenting the history of the firm. And in this book, which he published in 1942, he describes the impact that Nathaniel Courier had, writing that Nathaniel Courier's lifetime covered the conquest of the West, the harnessing of steam, the rise of industrialism, the Civil War and its aftermath of Reconstruction and Unification, there were years that saw an uncertain young republic establish itself as a great power, the formative years of a great nation, years crowded with events that cried for accurate and graphic presentation to a public that was becoming increasingly alive to the tempo of the times. Such a presentation, the firms of N. Courier and later Courier and Ives, were to provide generously in the form of inexpensive yet finely executed lithographic prints that made their way into nearly every home and became in an amazingly short time an American institution. Now, while Peters was writing under a lens of nostalgia and popular memory, there is no denying the impact that the firm of Courier and Ives had on a public who quickly devoured the visual imagery that finally accompanied news that could otherwise only be read about. Their prints ranged in prices from five to 25 cents, and the portfolios uh, ranged up to $3 a piece. They were popular among Americans of also social classes, but their target audience was decidedly white Americans and also European immigrants. The images were also frequently found cut out on the walls of many homes as well. Lithography, though, was actually invented in the late 1790s in Germany. While then the process was improved in France and England before finally reaching success in the United States, about 20 years later. To briefly explain the process, a lithographer would cut a stone to the size of a sheet of paper, grind it down until the stone had a smooth finish, carefully draw an image on it with a special kind of crayon. He would then moisten the stone with water and then roll ink over it, which would then attach only to the drawing and was repelled by the water. And although this still sounds like somewhat of a tedious process, Lithography was the first new printing technology in over 200 years, and it offered a more affordable and efficient way to mass-produce prints to sell to a large market. Instead of relying only on one person to complete the entire process, most firms were instead staffed by a number of people, those that created the design, those that carved and grained the stones, those that rolled the ink, those that colored the final prints, and countless other people. And it was these specialized jobs that helped companies like Courier and Ives streamline their business model. And in doing this, the company was able to minimize production costs, 
meet the demands of a rapidly changing news cycle while still producing compelling illustrations that appeal to a pretty wide audience. But before Courier and Ives reach this level of success together, their story really begins with a young Nathaniel Courier. When he was about 15 years old, Nathaniel Courier was hired on as an apprentice to the Pendleton lithography firm in Boston. And the Pendletons were the first commercially successful firm in America, but they really owed their success to a talented French lithographer who worked for them and trained the young Nathaniel. Five years later, when Nathaniel was about 20 years old, he moved on to Philadelphia, where he continued his training with another master lithographer, but he quickly opened up his own business in New York. And he did initially have a business partner by the name of Stoddart in 1834, but Courier really found more success by going out on his own. The next year, in 1835, he established his own firm under his own name of N. Courier and produced both commission works and commercially successful prints for over 20 years until he partnered with a man named James Ives. In 1852, Ives joined Courier, but he only started out as his bookkeeper, and he stayed in that role for nearly five years until the two men became full-fledged business partners and also brother-in-laws under their joint name of Courier and Ives. Now, although Ives was a self-trained artist himself, he actually just managed the business and finances, while Courier typically supervised production. And with these two men at the helm, the firm hired many people who contributed to their success. Now, as I mentioned, part of Courier and Ives' success relied on the many people who specialized in the individual parts of production. They had lithographers, colorists, and artists, both on staff and others who essentially worked as independent contractors who sold designs to the firm that really contributed to the staggering number of images that they produced. And while we do know the names of some of the artists like Fanny Palmer, Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate, Louis Maurer, George Dury, among some others, but many of the staff members were immigrants. And although the prints typically neglected to include the individual names, they all joined together under the name of N. Courier and later Courier and Ives. And these people brought with them their own perspectives and lived experiences to the prints that they produced, which they then shared and impacted to the greater public. Together, the firm produced over 7,000 individual titles that were then sold through dealers in almost every major American city. And the firm both produced images that reflected the interest of the public, while also at times, sometimes making political statements. Part of the firm's production process also included colorists, who were often young German immigrants, usually young women, who were responsible for applying a single color to the lithograph after it had been printed. You can think color by numbers, but at the highest level. And they applied these colors based on the model print that was usually completed by one or two of the staff artists. And this person was usually uh, Fanny Palmer. And the model print usually included in the notes, uh, in the margin, so to speak, dictating special instructions or if certain changes needed to be made. And the more popular prints were then reprinted as the demand increased as well. As they created these prints, some artists gravitated toward different subject matters. Fanny Palmer often designed the outdoor and recreational prints, and sometimes she would even use her family as models for the people in the scene. And although there were many people and staff who brought their own perspectives and knowledge, to accommodate such a broad span of topics, it necessitated artists being assigned with topics that they would otherwise be unfamiliar with. Louis Maurer, who you see here, and Arthur Fitzwilliam Tate 
were often responsible for the American Indian prints. In a later interview for Harry Peter's book, Maurer admitted that neither he nor uh, Tate had firsthand knowledge of the American Indians when they were working on these prints. And instead, they researched them at libraries and based their own illustrations on other images, uh, which included the art by a man named George Catlin. Catlin, however, and some of his contemporaries are now seen as controversial figures in the art world. George Catlin was a painter, but he also considered himself to be a scientist and an explorer. In the 1830s, as different American Indian groups were forcibly removed from their homes, ultimately leading to the culmination of the Trail of Tears, Catlin traveled and visited these tribes. And over the course of his travels, Catlin visited over 48 individual tribes and created over 500 paintings depicting portraits, scenes, and landscapes while also collecting American Indian artifacts for his own collection. Catlin was considered one of the first artists to depict American Indians in their own communities, and he is credited for painting them as a human being rather than the negative savage stereotype. Today, though, Catlin is considered a controversial figure because, despite his intentions, he exploited the American Indians that he came into contact with. To further his artistic career, he would sometimes even bring them along with him in order to advertise his paintings at his exhibits. Furthermore, despite Catlin's intentions, it does not appear that Tate and Maurer used these images in the same way. In the pursuit, which is the print that you see here, the focus is instead on the European American hunter overcoming his American Indian adversary, with other hunters in the, in the distance attacking American Indians. And it's this kind of image that would have encouraged the us versus them mentality to his largely white audience who would see this print. And at its core, that message was against Catlin's own artistic morals. However, this savage other stereotype continued to be associated with American Indians throughout the 19th century. The artists at the Inn Courier and later Courier and Ives firms also captured popular figures of the time, ranged from politicians to activists and even Queen Victoria of England. These, of course, uh, also included presidents and presidential candidates like James K. Polk, his running mate George Dallas, and even Sarah Childress Polk. While it wasn't common for the firm to produce prints of the First Ladies, it is, this image of Sarah Polk really demonstrates her place in American popular culture during the 19th century. She was her husband's partner both in life but also in business. Sarah Polk was a skillful politician in her own right, and she helped her husband build alliances with other politicians. And James K. Polk frequently asked his wife for her insight and advice. In the Tennessee State Museum collection, we have other Courier and Ives lithographs, many of which depict scenes from the life of Andrew Jackson. Now, Andrew Jackson was no stranger to portraiture. With the exception of George Washington, Jackson's image was captured more than any other person of his time. And this was in large part due to a man named Ralph E. W. Earle, who was a portraitist. The historian Rachel Stevens describes Earle as a court painter that served throughout Jackson's political career. Earle met Jackson after the Battle of New Orleans and was commissioned to paint this painting of him um, at the battle. But Earl ended up marrying Jackson's niece and subsequently even moved with Jackson into the White House after he was elected as president. Together, Jackson and Earl created a cult of personality around the Tennessee politician that was used to further his career and minimize any of his transgressions. 
Earl's portrait cemented a visual reference to this specially cultivated Jackson persona that left a long-lasting influence on the American public even after his death. Likely inspired by some of Earl's works, the end courier firm depicted numerous images of Jackson that included a print modeled as a presidential portrait, an imagining of Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans, as you see here, and even a piece of lore from Jackson's childhood in which a British soldier is thought to have slashed a teenage Jackson with his sword. And it's these scene prints in particular that would have encouraged a collective memory of the president, ultimately reinforcing the identity that Erlen Jackson had crafted for him. When Jackson died, Nathaniel Courier and his firm quickly produced a print depicting the president's death. And in this print, which is in the State Museum collection, Jackson is surrounded by family members mourning his recent passing, and they are consoling one another and even praying. And while we can recognize this as a scene of mourning today, in its time, this image would have likely evoked a strong emotional response to its viewers, depicting Jackson's death as the loss of a great hero while obscuring his egregious crimes against American Indians and enslaved people. This print would have been widely reproduced, and here you see another version of it from the Springville Museum. There are some differences when compared to the one in the State Museum collection, including the way the image is cropped, the lack of bed curtains, the color of the girl's dress, and even a different pattern for the carpet. And it's possible that these changes were marked as improvements on an artist model print to sell more copies demonstrating the popularity and demand for Jackson imagery. Mourning, however, was also a part of the culture of the 19th century, and it led to Americans using creative ways to process their grief. Many young women in particular created mourning watercolors, embroideries like the one you see here, hair jewelry, and other forms of memorials to their loved ones. Around 1846, a young woman named Sarah Caroline Gwynn from Sumner County, Tennessee, painted this watercolor of a young woman leaning against a large tombstone, and it appears she is crying. And the tombstone is inscribed, to the memory of L. B. W. Gwynn of Captain H. F. Murray's Company of Tennessee Volunteers, who departed this life at Camargo, Mexico, October 11th, 1846, aged 21 years, and it's followed by another prayer. Young Sarah painted this water watercolor in honor of her cousin, Littleberry Wright Gwynn. He was a soldier from Carroll County, Tennessee, who died during the Mexican-American War. And the arrangement of this painting is similar to many other memorial arts of the time, in which a person, usually a young woman, is standing next to a tombstone in a cemetery, and it usually looks like she's being supported by the tombstone of her loved one. Courier Knives artists use the same imagery for their memorial prints, which were likely commissioned. In this one, which you see here, is an undated memorial print dedicated to a man named Daniel Green. And in this image, you can see an almost identical arrangement to, uh, with a grieving woman, a large tombstone with an inscription, a weeping willow, with really the backgrounds being the only major change. These kinds of prints were another way that the lithography firm responded to cultural trends. But not all of the firm's prints were so solemn. They also produced more lighthearted and whimsical images as well. In the State Museum collection, we have this print of a baby in his crib with his sister lying nearby and their puppies lying with them. Something like this might have actually been hung up in a child's room. They also made prints that demonstrated the fashion of the time. 
1846, Queen Victoria commissioned a painting of her young son, who would later be the future King of England, in a sailor suit. And this playful image was meant to be a gift to her husband, Prince Albert. But instead, it actually inspired a new fashion. trend of young children in sailor suits both boys and girls and this trend lasted until the end of the 19th century but despite the abundance of prints and the firm's attempt to reach americans of all social classes their prints were really aimed at white americans as the firm frequently romanticized history and current events and while this rosy view might have worked with cartoons and images of children, the same approach was also taken with most of the images that depicted the lives of enslaved people. And instead of showing the horrors of life on a plantation, the firm, for example, would instead depict a romanticized home life in the country, showing happy slaves who were content with being owned as human chattel. Even in prints depicting black northerners, the images use racist stereotypes, such as this one, in which a black man is having to dance and perform for white spectators in order to get an eel. After the end of the Civil War, Courier and Ives produced a series about a fictional black segregated community called Darktown. A team of artists created over 100 prints for this series that perpetuated racist stereotypes of black, about black Americans, many of whom were recently emancipated. And these racist stereotypes in this series implied to the white audience that black Americans were ignorant and uneducated. These prints that came from the nation's most popular lithographic firm demonstrated the prevalence of racist attitudes that were still very much a part of the United States at the end of the 19th century. The images were reprinted thousands of times even after the business ended, responding to the demand of unpopularity for them. And this further reinforces how images like these su supported the systemic racism that was perpetuated throughout the 20th century as well. Now, despite the success of the firm and their artist's ability to comment on countless genres related to 19th century American culture, the firm eventually dissolved. Nathaniel Courier and James Ives left the business to their sons, but the sons had no interest really in transitioning the business to keep up with new technology. Lithography evolved once again into chromolithography, and many newspapers were now incorporating the involvement of photography to produce illustrated weeklies that provided drawings and photographs that corresponded to their labor. This new cycle. Even so, there is no denying the impact that the artists of Courier and Ives had, whether they were making political commentary, increasing a awareness of popular culture trends, or sharing images of important players and events. The work of Courier and Ives set an idyllic backdrop for mainstream 19th century American culture. <laughs>